Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Finn. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford and today I'll be talking about reinforcement learning for real robots. To start, I'd like to actually tell a bit of a story which is from the beginning of my PhD when we were interested in training robots with reinforcement learning to do tasks like this. In particular here, the robot is trying to learn a policy that maps from images taken from the robot's camera directly to torques applied at the robot's joints and is trying to learn how to place the red block into the corresponding hole in the shape sorting cube. Uh, and as you can see at the beginning of training, the robot knew very little about how to do the task. And over time, it's able to improve and get better and better through trial and error, and eventually acquire a policy that can solve the task. And here's the final policy that it learned. And you can also see the robot's first person viewpoint in the bottom right. We were pretty excited about this result because we felt like uh, we had a reinforcement learning algorithm that could solve not just this task of playing with a children's toy, but other tasks like placing the claw of a toy hammer underneath a nail, screwing a cap onto a bottle, and in some follow-up work, using a spatula to lift an object into a bowl. We were pretty excited about this result because we, it seemed like we had this sort of general purpose algorithm that may make it practical to train robots to do a variety of different tasks in the real world. And around the same time, people took ideas from, this, from these algorithms and applied them to their own robots, to train robots to hit a hockey puck into a goal, to open a door, and to throw an object to hit a target. And of course, around the same time, deep reinforcement learning algorithms were also being applied and developed for problems like Atari games and the game of Go and simulated robotic locomotion. So it seems like we've made a lot of progress in deep reinforcement learning, and we should be able to start actually applying these algorithms to the real world. However, we have a problem. And the big problem with these approaches is that the robots didn't learn how to use spatulas to lift objects and how to open all sorts of doors. The robot had learned how to use that spatula to lift that object into that bowl. And if you gave it a different spatula or a different tablecloth or change something about the environment, the robot would completely fail. Essentially, the robots are always learning one task in one environment, starting from scratch, tabula rasa. Essentially, the, the, essentially the, the room that the robot is was trained in is the entire world of the robot. Now you might say, well, okay, we just need to give it more spatulas and then it will be able to generalize more broadly, problem solved. But the problem is a bit more difficult than that. Essentially what we're trained, the way that we're approaching reinforcement learning for robotics, at least up until uh, this point, is essentially analogous to taking a, a newborn infant, giving a spatula and training it to use a spatula on day one. Clearly this isn't something that's going to work out if we care about ultimately building robots that can operate seamlessly in the real world in a variety of different environments to perform a variety of different tasks. So we need to rethink our approach. From a machine learning standpoint, we could think of the problem a bit like this, where our training distribution is much narrower than the test distribution in which we'd like to be able to generalize. We're training our robots in some lab environment and we'd like it to be able to generalize to the real world. So how do we go about trying to solve this problem and develop an approach that can ultimately work in the wild, in the real world? One natural reaction is that, well, I know how to use spatulas pretty well. I know how to use a variety of different objects. Can I build in my knowledge into the algorithm to help the robot? For example, I know things about physics, I know notions of objects, I know how the robot, what sort of equivariances the robot should be capable of handling, and maybe I have some ideas for different architectures that the robot might want to use when solving these different tasks. However, I think that this is not quite the right approach, even though it's a very natural reaction. First, while we humans are very good at generalizing to all sorts of environments, we don't know exactly how we do it. And even if we did know exactly how we did it, we don't know how to program this into algorithms 
for training robots. It's actually a very challenging thing to do. So what I'd like to talk about today is if we can do better than this kind of natural reaction and ultimately try to be able to train robots that can generalize to much broader distributions such as the real world. And with that problem in mind, I think that one thing we can learn from humans is that humans are able to accumulate and learn from very broad data and very broad experiences. They aren't trained on day one to do one narrow task. They're able to explore the richness of the real world and leverage that data when solving tasks and when learning new tasks. So with that in mind, I think that we should think about if we want robots to generalize broadly, we should try to train them with equally broad data. Essentially kind of broaden the distribution of data that they're trained on so that they will more naturally generalize to new test uh, distributions. And the corollary to this is that we shouldn't just necessarily plug in more diverse data into our existing algorithms, but we should also try to develop algorithms that can learn from scalable sources of data. With that in mind, uh, today I'll talk about three things that are, pertain to this problem. First, how can robots acquire broad and diverse experiences? Second, how can algorithms actually learn from such broad and diverse data sources? And third, how can robots be robust to inevitable disturbances and changes in the real world? Okay, so let's first talk about this first problem of getting data in the first place. How do we go about collecting data? One approach might be to collect data with random actions. We can collect data that looks like this on the robot. This data is actually quite cheap to collect. We can run the robot nearly 24 seven to collect data like this. Um, we can also give it deformable objects, for example, and have it collect data with those kinds of objects. The takeaway here is we can collect a lot of data this way. And while this data does contain interesting interactions, the utility of this data is limited. We won't be able to learn how to, for example, use tools or spatulas from data like this. So how can we collect more interesting data? One thing we could do, and one natural alternative, is to provide demonstrations. We could have a human guide the robot through certain actions to get data like this. This, of course, leads to really useful and interesting data, including data of robots using tools. However, this requires a human very deeply in the loop of the data collection process. And as a result, it doesn't allow us to collect a lot of interesting data. OK, so another approach we might imagine is, well, maybe instead of trying to tell you operate the robot to do things, what if we provide videos of humans doing things? Uh, for example, there are really awesome data sets of humans doing all sorts of things. For example, this Epic Kitchens data set by Damon et al. Uh, and this data is actually already available and it contains really interesting and useful interactions. So we get loads of interesting data this way. Unfortunately, this data is hard for a robot to use because there's considerable domain shift between the human and the robot and both in terms of the, the morphology and the degrees of freedom of the human and the robot, and also just, be, just also in terms of the appearance of the human and the robot. Uh, but we'll come back to this. I think that this could potentially be a promising route to get interesting and diverse data for robots. Nonetheless, it seems like with these two extremes of random data versus demonstration data, we need to think about how we can scalably collect useful data and interesting data for robots. Now, one popular approach for doing this, as opposed to random data, would be to use things like curiosity and, and novelty seeking methods to try to seek out interesting states and allow the robot to autonomously explore those parts of the environment. And so what we did is we actually took a novelty seeking method and ran it on this robot here. And in particular, we ultimately wanted the robot to be able to open this drawer right here. And so we took the uh, novelty seeking method. In particular, we took this method from uh, Sekar et al. called Plan to Explore that was published in ICML this year. And we ran it on the robot where the robot is observing RGB images and it's trying to explore novel parts of the environment that lead to prediction error in its model. 
And what we found is that uh, there are so many interesting and novel parts of real world images that the robot very rarely interacted with, uh, for example, this drawer, because there were so many different things to potentially explore. So with this in mind, we wanted to think about, well, maybe there are ways that users can help show the robot interesting things without having a human in the loop of the data collection process. And if the human can help the robot in a way that isn't in the loop, then we might be able to be able to, you might be able to scalably collect a lot of data that's more interesting than approaches that try to explore everything and more targeted than approaches that try to explore everything. And so what we did is at the beginning, we first show the robot examples of interesting states. So here are some example images on the left, for example, of the robot interacting with the drawer that I pointed out before. And then once we show the robot these interesting states, we simultaneously learn to classify between interesting examples and data that the robot explored, as well as trying to explore to find images that are classified as interesting. So we'll learn this binary classifier that takes as input human provided states and the agent's own observations, train a classifier to be able to distinguish between these two things, and the robot will continuously try to find states that look more like the human provided states. Interestingly, this approach requires only a very small amount of human guidance at the very beginning, and the rest of the process is entirely autonomous. And what we found is after giving the robot less than three minutes of human guidance, and then allowing the robot to autonomously explore, the robot was able to identify kind of interesting parts of the state space and explore those parts of the state space much more effectively than without that human guidance. So here's qualitatively what the exploration looked like. And quantitatively, we also see a huge increase in the amount of interaction with the drawer using this approach compared to using novelty seeking methods such as disagreement. And so the takeaway here is that a small amount of human guidance, just a few minutes at the beginning of the learning process can go a long way towards enabling robots to autonomously collect interesting data. Okay, so that's one, in my mind, really promising approach to allow robots to acquire broad and diverse experiences. And as well as another, a number of other interesting ideas for how we might acquire data sources. Now, how do we allow algorithms to learn from such data? In many ways, this is inherently an offline reinforcement learning problem where we have a means to collect a static data set. And now we need to be able to run reinforcement learning in a way that allows us to leverage that static offline data set. Our lab has been working on this problem actually in a number of different veins and approaches. And um, we've actually been working on it for, for quite a while. Um, so we have uh, some works from actually three or four years ago on using offline reinforcement learning actually in a self-supervised setting to accomplish different kinds of tasks um, from, from random data. More recently, we've been looking at model, offline model-based RL approaches and offline model-based RL from images in a setting where you have reward functions. We've also been looking at offline meta reinforcement learning where we have data from multiple different tasks and want to be able to quickly learn a new task using that offline multitask data. So there's a number of different works that we've been studying, and there's also been a number of different works that the community has studied as well. What I'd actually like to focus on in my talk today is actually one aspect of learning from offline data, which is trying to leverage offline videos of humans. I mentioned before that videos of humans may be actually a pretty interesting and promising data source for robots to be able to learn from because there's a ton of data on the internet of this of really interesting human interactions. Uh, and there's not just a lot of it, but it's also very interesting and, and likely useful data if we can address the challenges. So in particular, the problem setting that we're gonna look at is we're gonna assume that we have videos of humans, um, maybe like a hundred or a couple hundred videos of humans. And we want a robot to be able to do, perform the same sort of task, but in a different environment and of course, the robot looks different from what the human looks like and has different degrees of freedom. So we want to be able to learn from these offline videos as well as online robot interaction. 
Now, the way that we're going to do this is actually really simple. The key idea is that we're going to add our offline videos to the replay buffer of our reinforcement learning agent and then just run reinforcement learning with online data collection in the robot environment, but keeping the offline videos in the replay buffer as useful experience for the robot to leverage. Now, this might seem a little bit uh, crazy in some ways because the videos of humans look quite different from the robot environment. And there's a number of things we have to address before we can directly run reinforcement learning with these videos of humans. Um, so we need to be able to tackle the domain shift between these two domains. We need to be able to address the fact that the videos of humans don't have any action labels. And third, we need to be able to address the fact that with these videos of humans, we also don't know what the reward function corresponds to. And for each of these three things, we actually took really the simplest approach we could imagine to try to solve each of them and found that actually the simplest approach works quite well. So for domain shift, we use adversarial domain confusion, which is a very popular and standard approach for learning domain invariant representations. And we also leveraged some approximately paired images for trying to uh, make it easier to learn a representation that's invariant across these two domains. And then in terms of the actions, we trained an inverse model on the robot environment and then trained an inverse, trained an inverse model on the robot environment and use that inverse model to label the actions of the videos of humans. This was actually leveraging both the inverse model as well as the domain invariant representation. This is quite simple. And then lastly, for rewards, for the videos of humans, we simply label the last state as having a high reward and label all of the other states in the trajectory as having a low reward. So that's basically it. We learn a domain invariant representation. On top of that domain invariant representation, we learn an inverse model that's used to label the actions of the, of the humans. And then we also use a very simple and naive scheme for labeling the rewards on the videos of humans. Now let's go into a little bit more detail. So we consider two different experimental tasks. One is opening a drawer and one is pushing this red puck to a black target position. And in the simulation environment that the robot is learning online in, there are sparse binary rewards when the robot has succeeded versus not succeeded. And the robot only receives image observations as shown in these two images. So these are quite challenging tasks if you were to try to learn them from scratch. We want to be able to leverage the videos of humans in order to accelerate the reinforcement learning process. And then to show us some examples of the paired data, they look something like this. Uh, we had only a few hundred paired images, which is substantially less than the amount of total video data that we had. Uh, and the pairing is only approximate, as you can see here. So for example, in this image, the robot is the, the human is touching the puck, whereas the robot isn't quite touching it. Um, and these are just kind of paired using some initial random robot data, as well as the human videos. And one of the things that you might notice is that actually in none of these, um, in none of these paired data, the in none of them, the robot ha hasn't solved the task. So none of these images have the robot actually opening the drawer, or none of these uh, images have the robot putting the puck on the goal. Uh, only the human data in this pair data is good, and the robot data just came from a random initial policy. And then when we actually ran this algorithm and actually ran reinforcement learning with the videos of humans in the replay buffer, uh, we found that on these two environments, we saw a, a 2x efficiency gain between leveraging the videos of humans versus just running standard reinforcement learning in these environments, which is shown in green. So these videos allow us to learn significantly more efficiently than if we were to try to train from scratch just using online data from the robots environment. Uh, further, we also experimented with a couple of simulation environments where there aren't any domain shift and there's just the lack of actions and the lack of rewards in the data. And we found that uh, this approach of learning from videos shows substantial gains over 
prior approaches for learning from observation, including behavior cloning from observation, BCO, and uh, ILQ. Okay, so the takeaway here is that we actually have promising approaches for leveraging videos of humans for the reinforcement learning process. Now, what I'd like to talk about last is once we have these broad data sources and once we have mechanisms to learn from these data sources, how can the robot be robust when things ultimately change when the robot is operating in the real world? We're first, we're gonna consider a setting where there's just one training environment that the robot learned in. In particular, the robot had learned how to grasp different objects in this bin as shown here. And we want the robot to be able to be robust to lots of different kinds of test environments, such as harsh lighting conditions, such as transparent water bottles that the robot had never seen before, such as a checkerboard background, and also changes in morphology, such as a 10 centimeter offset of the gripper. Now, if we take the policy that was trained in this environment initially, it had an 86% success rate in grasping objects. And when we took this initial policy and deployed it in the test environments, performance dropped substantially to between 32 and 50%. So how can we actually try to enable the robot to be robust to these environments? One key assumption that we're going to make is that the robot has the ability to collect a modest amount of data in the test environment in order to be able to adapt and not just try to be robust in zero shot. So the simplest thing we can do, um, I guess one, maybe one uh, like auxiliary takeaway here is that simple ideas are really useful and really helpful, um, are much easier to try when you're in large scale real world settings. So the simple idea we wanted to try is just to use fine tuning. And we know that fine tuning works well in computer vision and works, works well in natural language processing, but we actually haven't seen a lot of evidence of how well fine tuning works in reinforcement learning and in robotic reinforcement learning. So we wanted to test how well it allows us to adapt to these different domains. So what we did is we took our, this initial grasping system, it was trained on 600,000 600, grasps, grasp attempts. We then used the QTOPT algorithm to train an initial Q function on this data. This was done kind of previously, this is the policy that gives us 86% success rate. And then we collect up to 800 grasp attempts in the target environment. This, uh, we just do this with the initial base policy. This gets us around 43% success when the robot gripper has been offset. And then we fine tune our Q function on this, on a mix of the target data and some of the original data to try to adapt to the setting. And then ultimately, once we've fine tuned on some of the new data, we then deploy this adapted Q function. And what we see is actually, in this case, the adapted Q function is able to rise, it, bring its success rate up from 43% to 98% with only 800 grasps, which is like slightly more than 1 100th of the original data set size. Okay, so. How does fine tuning work across the board for all sorts of different changes to the environment? So we looked at a, a range of different challenging tasks with uh, variety with changes that are both visual as well as physical. We see strong improvements even after only 25 grasp attempts in the new environment, which I actually found pretty surprising and, and, and quite, uh, quite promising. We also found that ImageNet pre-training performs poorly overall, and that pre-training on the grasping task is actually much better than trying to pre-train features on something like ImageNet. Um, and then of course, after, after the full 400 or 800 grasps, we see typically see the kind of maximal improvement uh, from fine tuning. What does this look like qualitatively? So in the harsh lighting conditions, we see the robot has a tendency to grasp at its own reflection. Uh, whereas after the fine tuning process, it figures out that it should not grasp at its own reflection and it should grasp uh, the objects in the scene and it can successfully grasp more, more frequently and more robustly. 
uh, in the offset gripper case, uh, the, the original policy had bad aim, understandably. And with fine tuning, the system is able to grasp uh, much more effectively and able to uh, kind of navigate its gripper to the objects more effectively. In the checkerboard setting, we found that the pre-trained policy has a tendency to grasp at the checkerboard, um, at the, the boxes in the checkerboard, whereas the fine-tuned policy has is able to kind of pretty quickly learn that grasping at the checkerboards isn't a successful strategy for it successfully getting reward and grasping objects. Okay. And so the takeaway here is that we can extrapolate to new environments if we just allow the robot to collect an afternoon's worth of data and sometimes even just 25 grasp attempts. Essentially, we're just having the robot continue to learn when it's in those new environments in a sort of lifelong learning framework. Uh, in many ways, this is what reinforcement learning is built for. It allows systems to continuously learn as things change, uh, but in many, in many situations, we actually don't think of reinforcement learning that way, and we often just evaluate the final policy and assume that we should keep it fixed. Uh, and this suggests that when we're in the real world and when things might be changing, we should just continue to run reinforcement learning and have the robot uh, continuously adapt to things that are changing. Now, it's also worth mentioning that with uh, things like meta learning, we should be able to accelerate this adaptation process so that we don't need 800 grasps. Uh, and we've seen this in a legged locomotion example where we can adapt actually online in real time to changes like a missing leg on the robot as well as a slope. Uh, and we've also seen how meta learning can allow us to adapt to distribution shift with only unlabeled data rather than requiring data that has reward labels, for example. Okay, so to summarize what I talked about today, I think that if we want robots to generalize broadly, we need about we need to think about how we should train them with equally broad data. And this is actually quite different from the standard way that we think about online reinforcement learning, where we think about training an agent for one task starting from scratch without any existing data. Um, I talked about how we can acquire broad and diverse experiences and how in this setting, a small amount of out of the loop guidance can go a long way. I also talked about how leveraging offline data sets is going to be a core piece for allowing robots and other real world reinforcement learning agents to be able to generalize broadly in the real world. And finally, I talked about how simply continuing to learn when things change allows agents to be robust to pretty substantial changes in the environment, such as harsh lighting conditions, changes in morphology, and variation in the background and the objects. And I think that all of these are really important steps and ingredients for actually deploying reinforcement learning systems in the real world uh, and, and something that we're, we're, of course, really excited to work towards in the future. Now, what other ingredients are missing? So I talked about three things in my talk, but there are other things that aren't aren't quite there yet and that I think are also quite important for actually deploying reinforcement learning systems in the real world. The first is how can we share and accumulate data across institutions? So while in my talk we were leveraging much larger and broader data sources than what we've seen typically, all of the data that we were still collecting was still from a single lab and from a single institution, which from a machine learning standpoint is somewhat ridiculous. It's kind of standard in machine learning and reinforcement learning to share data across institutions rather than collecting data for each and every experiment that you run. As kind of one potential step towards sharing and accumulating data across institutions, we've started the open RoboNet database, which has data from four different institutions and seven robot platforms and includes uh, in its initial version, 15 million video frames. And I hope that this is something we'll, that will allow people to share and accumulate data from robots across institutions and allow us to run reinforcement learning on much broader data sources. Beyond the data side of things, one issue that I largely swept under the rug in my talk today is the problem of how we specify tasks or rewards to robots. 
in the real world, we don't get rewards coming or we don't naturally get extrinsic rewards coming to us or any form of supervision uh, naturally. And we need to critically think about what is the best way to specify tasks or specify rewards to robots. One promising approach to this in my mind is some, some work that we did a couple years ago on learning goal classifiers from a small number of examples with MedLearning, such that we could hopefully just eventually just show a few examples of what success looks like for a robot. And from there, it could then learn a success classifier that allows it to kind of learn what it means to accomplish that sort of task. But ultimately, we may also want elements of language or speech to play a role in task specification as well. And I think that even what form of, uh, what form of task specification even makes sense, whether it's a reward function, a demonstration, or something else, is still an open question. And then lastly, one other thing that I didn't talk about in my talk is how can we ensure safety, not just in terms of the final policy, but also during the reinforcement learning process itself. This is something that we've largely been able to work around in the robotics settings that we've looked at by kind of hard coding constraints on where the robot can move and ensuring that it doesn't ever apply too much force on a table, for example. But ultimately, when robots are in unconstrained environments, thinking about safety will likely be more important, especially if we want robots to be able to move quickly and swiftly in their environment. Uh, and kind of as a step towards this, one direction that I'm excited about is thinking about how robots might be able to learn from failures and from safety incidents, how to be safe and how to prevent uh, safety uh, failures in the future, including when robots are trying to learn new tasks. Uh, but of course, this is also an open problem. Okay, and with that, I'll end there. I'd like to thank my students, and I especially like to thank and highlight uh, the work done by um, the students that I presented in this talk, uh, including Annie Chen, Suraj Nair, Alex Nam, Ryan Julian, Carl Schmeckpepper, and Oleg Rybkin.